thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turn. They fail not as thou hast been and forever will be. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth Let the Leah Chorus say amen. amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Marshall Mitchell, the pastor of Salem Baptist Church of Abington. I am a former John Cheney Sunny Hill camper. I'm still running suicides and running around the gym. Let us all be mindful that while we are in a stadium, we are also in a worship service, and that this is the homegoing service of someone who has meant so much to so many people, many of whom he did not know. And people all around the world are pausing to acknowledge that this man came this way and impacted these people. It is my desire that this worship service should go as neatly and smoothly as possible. Were this a black Baptist church and there were 13 speakers, we would be here until tomorrow. We will not be here until tomorrow. And I ask that everyone would be mindful of the time as well as the needs of this family. And we know that there are endless and countless stories which all of us could share. If you are on the program, I ask now that you would do what Coach Cheney taught all of us and have great court awareness. You will not be called by name. We will follow the order of service as it is printed with one exception. Keith Richardson will be added before the acknowledgments of resolutions and cards on behalf of Coach Cheney's fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Proverbs, I'll repeat. I wanted to share a highlighted scripture left in my grandpa's Bible that he kept next to his bed. Proverbs 18. This is, is a dedication to his wife, my grandmother, Jean Cheney. He that hath found a good wife hath found a good thing and shall receive pleasure from the Lord. This next scripture reminded me of my grandpa. No matter where he is with his family, his basketball players, or in the grocery store, he would always instill wisdom in people. Verse 15, a wise heart shall acquire knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh instruction. I will be reading from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, creator, sustainer, keeper, not just this world, but all creation and the cosmos. We thank thee, O God, that you have allowed each and every one of us to have had our soul's delight and our life's fill this giant of a man. 
We're grateful, O oh God, that he touched each and every one of us and people of all walks of life so enormously with his wisdom, his wit, and his ways. And merciful and eternal God, as it feels and seems right now that the clock on Coach Cheney has run out. We thank thee, O God, that thou art the God of overtime, that you have allowed us to not just access time, but you've allowed us to access eternity. And it is with those sobering yet comforting thoughts that we give hearty thanks and praise for the life of Coach Cheney. One who figured out a way to let basketball be an entree to the deeper parts of our very beings. And who coached and pushed and sometimes shouted to bring out better things in all of us. So we pray right now, O oh God, that the better things that he has inculcated and brought out of us would find real life right now, as we need to find ways to be strong, yet emotionally available to our fears, our hurt, and our pain. Comfort now this widow and her children and their children. Great and tall basketball players who have been so strong but now are so rocked by this loss. Comfort the temple community and let them know that you are still their God and that you neither slumber nor sleep. Give us now that John 14 gift, that peace that we can only find in thee. It is in the comforting and matchless name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen.
that gospel feast that promised land where all cross over in the two campground Good afternoon. On the behalf of Kappa Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, we are praying for the Cheney family during the loss of Coach Cheney. He touched a lot of lives, not just in the world of basketball, but also in his fraternity in the many years he served as a member. I'm reading to you this afternoon a resolution from the fraternity. As stated, resolution adopted by Philadelphia Alumni Chapter on the passing of brother John Cheney. Whereas our, brother, our beloved brother, John Cheney, was born away to the chapter invisible on the 29th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2021. And whereas brother Cheney was born on the 21st day of January in the year of our Lord, 1932. Brother Cheney was educated through the school district of Philadelphia at Ben Franklin High School where he earned Philadelphia Public League Player of the Year in 1951. Brother Cheney went on to earn a bachelor's degree from Bethune-Cookman College, now Bethune-Cookman University. Brother Cheney achieved NAIAA All-American Honors and an NAIA Tournament MVP before going pro in 1955 to play with the Harlem Trotters and the Pennsylvania Eastern League. And whereas Brother Cheney was a fall 1953 initiate into the Bethune-Cookman University chapter, the Gamma Theta of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. And whereas Brother Cheney was a tireless worker within Kappa, serving the fraternity with distinction for 68 years. And whereas Brother Cheney was also a tireless worker outside of Kappa and a true example of inspiring service in the public interest and achievement in every field of human endeavor. Two of Kappa Alpha Psi's five objectives. Brother Cheney toiled in his work as a devoted husband a 67 years to his wife, Jean Dixon, and as a father to his three children, Daryl Cheney, John Cheney Jr., and daughter Pamela Clark. Furthermore, Brother Cheney also achieved in his role as a professional college basketball coach with an overall record of 741 wins and 312 losses, earning him an induction into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 2001 and the National College Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in 2006. Brother Cheney is revered as one of the greatest teacher coaches in sports, a mentor and a father figure to so many young men and women who had the opportunity to meet him. Brother Cheney was known as an advocate in showing youngsters received more opportunities to have a successful life, not less. And whereas 
It is with honor that this resolution is proclaimed to the meritorious achievement of Brother John Cheney, reflecting well upon his steadfast commitment to the traditions and expectations of Kappa men. Therefore, being it resolved that the family of our beloved brother receive a copy of the resolution expressive of the esteem in which the fraternity will always hold our brother and appropriately honor his memory. And be it finally resolved that the Philadelphia alumni chapter file copies of this resolution among this permanent archives and forward a copy to our international headquarters to do likewise. Done by the authority of the Philadelphia alumni chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated on this, the second day of February in the year of our Lord, 2021, Cap Officer of Fraternity Incorporated, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, signed by Damon S. Jackson Esquire, Polmark, and Wendell Griffith, Keeper of Records. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The family would like to acknowledge the following who have sent citations or letters of condolences. State Representatives Chris Rabb and Malcolm Kenyatta, who will be mailing a citation to the family from the House of Representatives. A letter of condolence from Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson. We would also like to acknowledge the following cards from loved ones. Beyond Life's Gateway, there's an open gate at the end of the road through which each must go alone. And there, in a light we cannot see, our Father claims his own. Beyond the gate, your loved one finds happiness and rest, and there is comfort in the thought that a loving God knows best. May the same God who has welcomed your loved one home keep you in his care through this difficult time. Love and blessings, Coach Jarris Hughes and Mrs. Shirlene Hughes. There's also a letter written to the family. Our brother Cheney, as we called him, was one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, black or white. What stands out in my mind about him was his love of basketball as he taught and coached young men. He not only taught and coached them about the game, but also about life and treating mankind with love and respect. <laughs> he always encouraged his players to receive their degree. Many coaches don't do that even today. They are more concerned about winning games than anything else. We have lost a great legend in the sports world who was known and respected for his brilliant coaching ethics. He was fiery and sometimes out of control, but to know him was to love him. We love you, brother. This letter is from Carl C. Hughes Sr., Cheney's colleague from Bethune-Cookman College, who played football there and is also a fraternity brother of Kappa Alpha Psi, Inc., and was a former football coach. Also, Carl's brother, Jarris Hughes, who knew Cheney as a young gym teacher and coach here in Philadelphia, and is also a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi, Inc. Love and blessing to all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. One good person can touch more hearts than we'll ever know. To the Cheneys celebrating the lasting legacy of someone who meant so much. 
and wishing you comfort today and in your loss. Our deepest, deepest sympathy. May God comfort you to this time, I'm sorry, in this time, and may a life long lived and loved remind you of all the wonderful memories of husband, father, grandfather, sustain you. Love the Ireland's Becky, Joey, Bunky. In sympathy, John Maria, John III, may it comfort you to know that death cannot diminish the important ways your loved one touched your life and the lives of so many. That grief cannot take away the happiness you shared. That sorrow will fade in time, but love remains forever. And what a love you shared. Peace and comfort, Leslie. With wishes for all kinds of healing as you and your family say goodbye to someone who meant so much. Hope you can feel the love that's surrounding you now and all the ways you need and sympathy. We are so sorry for your loss. Love, Pete and Joanne Montero. Dad's loss is felt by all of us. We want to say thank you to everyone who sent a prayer, cards, flowers, or just made a call. It has meant so much to all of us. Although his life here on earth is done, the memories will keep him right here with us. So let's keep that coming. Your kind words and sympathy are felt by us all in your endless empathy. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I want to thank you, Pastor Mitchell, and all of our speakers and musical artists. You honor us by your presence. And I want to thank Senator Street for being here. You also honor us by your presence, and thank you for all you do. And I want to thank my good friend, Maria, whom I call Maria for the wonderful reading of the cards and acknowledgments. To those of you in the Leah Chorus Center and the thousands watching remotely, we welcome you all to Temple University. On behalf of the members of the Temple family, I want to express our deepest sympathies and condolences to you, Jean, and Pam, and John Jr and all of your extended family members. We mourn along with you the loss of an amazing human being. We will keep you in our prayers. Thank you for allowing us to show our deep respect and love for Coach by having this celebration in the very facility that he inaugurated and made famous by his deeds. This afternoon, we will hear many stories about Coach. Each will contain a truth about this great man that needs to be told. Here is my truth about him. I've spent my entire adult life in education. I can tell you without hesitation that John Cheney was a great teacher. Now, he clearly taught the fundamentals of basketball how to execute a matchup zone, how to function as a team, how to avoid turning the ball over, uh, and so much more. Look around at the banners in this arena and you can see just how successful he was. But John Cheney was not satisfied with just teaching basketball. He taught life. When he retired, very little of his retirement speech was about basketball, he knew that there were more important lessons. He taught young men how to stand up for themselves, how to find their voice and use it when they see a need for social justice. He taught them to have faith in themselves, 
to face challenges and find power even in their frustrations. He is famous for these big lessons, but I know he also taught them. He taught us how to be kind, how to remember those we love, and most especially those who need our love. Most of all, he taught self-discipline and fairness and caring for the most vulnerable people in our society. How to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. How to be present, not just physically, but also how to be there in mind and spirit. He taught us that time is a very precious commodity and never to waste it. And he taught us that every human being deserves respect and that the rules of an organization and a society need to be fair for everyone without exception. No doubt, John Cheney was a great teacher. Yet there was another role which he took on, one that grew over the ages. In addition to being the head of the wonderful Cheney family, he was also the head of another great family. He led a Temple family. His siblings included his dear friends, Peter Leochorus, Jay Norman, Jim Maloney, Essie Davis, Gavin White, Pat Swigert, Jim White, and so many other partners. His offspring and students were Don Staley and Aaron McKee and Mark Macon and countless others. Former Temple coach Bruce Arians said it well this past week as he prepared for the Super Bowl. He said, and I quote, John Cheney was a great coach and a greater man. He taught me about leadership and always being truthful and true to yourself. That's from Coach Arians. Coach Cheney led his Temple family like he did his teams, with straight talk and love. Every family has a home. There has been, is now, and always will be a home for John Cheney here at Temple. Whether it is the McGonagall Court, where his 5 a.m. practices remain legendary, or the basketball court beneath us which bears his name, Temple University will always be a place of love and respect for John Cheney. Thank you, Coach, for all you've taught us. Thank you, Coach, for being such an outstanding ambassador for Temple University and for all of education. And thank you, Coach, for never, never compromising on what is most important. Coach, we love you. Welcome home. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we'll now hear from the Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, followed by Senator Sharif Street, and then we will move in order with Mr. Dunphy. He was a legend and a role model for a generation. As Governor of Pennsylvania, I extend my deepest condolences to the Cheney family and to Temple University to the Temple University community on the passing of former Owls basketball coach John Cheney. John was a legend and a role model for a generation of players and fans, but more than that, he was a good man, one who believed in the power of education and fought to help young people, and especially young people of color, get the education they deserved. In addition to his many well-deserved accolades as head coach of the Owls, John was named Pennsylvania Teacher of the Year in 1979. He taught his students and players to make the most of the opportunities a good education provides. With John's passing, Pennsylvania has lost one of our brightest stars, and our entire Commonwealth mourns with you. He taught his students and players to make the most of the opportunities a good education provides. With John's passing, Pennsylvania has lost one of
to the family of Coach Cheney, uh, on behalf of the people of uh, North Philadelphia and Philadelphia, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the Senate of Pennsylvania, we offer our sincere, most sincere condolences. I have the, I'm going to read this uh, citation, which has been duly adopted by, unanimously by all members of the Pennsylvania Senate and bears the seal of the Senate. Whereas the Senate of Pennsylvania mourns the loss of John Cheney, who passed away on January 29th, 2021, at the age of 89. And whereas born on January 21st, 1932 in Jacksonville, Florida, Mr. Cheney was raised in Philadelphia and attended Benjamin Franklin High School. A 1955 graduate of Bethune-Cookman University in Detana, Daytona Beach, Florida, he returned to Philadelphia and began his professional basketball career with the Harlem Globetrotters NBA team and the Eastern League, where he played for nearly 10 years and was twice voted most valuable player. In the early 1960s, Mr. Cheney began teaching physical education and coaching basketball at the William L. Sayre Junior High School and later transitioned to Simon Gratz High School, where he served as a health and physical education teacher and dean of boys. In 1972, he became head coach of the, NCAA, of the men's basketball team at Cheney State College, where he led the Wolves to victory in 1978, NCAA Division II Men's Basketball Championship, the only team from Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference to win the top title. He held that position for 10 years. Mr. Cheney was then hired as head coach of the basketball team at, Ch at Temple University, where he remained for 24 years and led the team to 17 National Collegiate Athletic Association tournaments and five regional finals. To his great credit, he, cre he co-created the Cheney Sony, Sunny Hill basketball camp that went on to serve both male and female players from all over the world, went on to play at college, at the college and professional levels. Mr. Cheney enjoyed cooking, playing tennis, golfing, playing cards, and spending time with his family and friends. And Whereas a man of great character, Mr. Cheney will be remembered fondly by family, members, friends, and all others who knew him. His, great, his spirit for love of life will continue to inspire future generations for many years to come. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Senate of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania note with great sadness the passing of John Cheney, whose life greatly benefited all those who lived, served, and worked with him and extend heartfelt condolences to his wife, Jean Dixon Cheney, son, John Jr., daughter, Pamela, eight grand grandchildren, step-grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren, and many other family members and friends. And be it further resolved that a copy of this document sponsored by Senator Sharif Street, Carolyn T. Kamita, and John Kane be transmitted to Miss Jean Dixon Cheney it is signed by Jake Corman, President Pro Tem of the Senate, attested to by Megan Martin, the Secretary of the Senate, and bears the seal of the Senate, and is a official and a copy of this, an additional copy of this will be held in the records of the Senate of Pennsylvania for all to review for all of posterity. Um, we thank you for sharing him with us, and we thank him for the great legacy that he left. And we thank you, Coach, for all of those people you held. Some people are pebbles in a pond. You were a boulder in the ocean. Good afternoon. <clears throat> First of all, to the family, you humble me by asking me to say a few words about our friend John Cheney. To those players and coaches, both at Cheney and at Temple, you had the opportunity to be with him every single day and learn from him these unbelievable lessons that he taught. And I'm sure they were countless in their number. To the family of Jay Norman, who 
left us a couple days ago. Uh, a great Temple player, had a chance to coach here for a number of years after that, and just a good human being, a great man. When Maria asked if I would speak the other day, I started thinking of all sorts of things that have happened over the last 10 days and, uh, and how lucky I was to be asked to do that. I was thinking about if there was, an, if there was another combination of coach and university that fits better than John Cheney and Temple University, I don't know it. It was just a great marriage, a great partnership. They lived well together. He was a man that I succeeded here at Temple. A daunting task, I want you to know. I needed his support, and he gave it to me. He was always there to give me that support. I would ask him on occasion for advice. He'd give it to me, but it was always followed by support. He was always my mentor, and then he became my very good friend. Over the last few years, just about every one of our conversations, and maybe they took place every three, four weeks, they always ended with, I love you, Franny. Nobody calls me Franny, but he did. <laughs> And I accepted it, and it was, it was Coach Cheney. It meant a lot to me. I wanted him to be proud of our team, how our guys played and represented Temple. When we didn't take care of the ball in a particular game, I knew the next morning I was going to get a phone call, and we were going to talk about turnovers. And I looked forward to it. I never had a problem with it. I love this complexity and his accompanying simplicity. I must have heard him speak a hundred times. He probably spoke thousands and thousands of times. I don't know that I ever saw him take out a note. There was nothing that was, memor it was all memorized, it was all from his heart. And he would go off on some of these tangents and always bring it back to the initial topic that he talked about true genius. All of those thoughts were in his head. Even more of those thoughts were in his heart. And he had a spectacular soul. He was a brilliant speaker. He paused his words perfectly. He emphasized his words perfectly. He had a gift and he used it. He spoke for so many who didn't have the opportunity that he got. He spoke for those people. He was an activist. He was a civil rights leader. He made a difference as a teacher, as a coach. And his greatest impact probably came from his genuine humanity and his concerned empathy. I don't know that I met a man more empathetic in my life. He had a great sense of humor. He would tell you these stories and he'd be laughing the whole time he was telling you the story. He enjoyed it more than anybody else did, for sure. And while he laughed, he also cried. I can remember watching him on, uh, I don't know who created Senior Day in, in the college basketball world, but it's a pretty emotional day. And I can remember all of his players coming out onto the court, meeting him at half court, just about every time his, the tears would be coming from his eyes. He showed his vulnerability, and that led to even greater success that he had as a leader. Being vulnerable was something that he showed to us that is a good thing. Over the last 10 days or so, we've had great testimonials and tributes to, to a great man. They've had, uh, I've reread so many different things that I read a number of years ago to include that piece called The Whitler, which is pretty impressive. And then I went back and watched a, a, a segment or two of Daily News Live with Neil Hartman, Mike Kern, Dick Girardi on Christmas Eve. If you go back and watch those things, it's just unmiked John Cheney. And you could go anywhere with those discussions. I spoke to countless others who just wanted to speak about what he meant to them. And I was glad to hear those stories. Coach Cheney was always there when you need him. 
He was there to give his views on a topic like Proposition 48. He changed the NCAA's way of looking at things and that specific law. He meant so much to all coaches throughout the country, especially those of color, and he fought endlessly for opportunity. I love those conversations. Those conversations could be politics. God knows he had a myriad of ideas and thoughts about politics. Food was in there. He loved talking about food, food for thought, as well as food for your appetite. And it would always get back to basketball, always get back to turnovers, and then we'd finish with life and how we could both do it a little bit better. There were a number of coaches, and Leonard, Leonard Stewart's here with us today, uh, who got together this morning at 5.30 to have their team practice in tribute to this man. So I salute you on that, Leonard. He would lead off sentences oftentimes with, try to remember these stories. He would say, try to remember now. He wanted us to reach back to when we were youngsters, because that was another one of his great terms, youngsters. And he wanted us to have empathy for others, especially young people. Give them a chance. During our talks, I would listen because he was teaching and I was in class. And there was a no-cut policy when you were talking with Coach Cheney. He showed us we could be demanding, but we can still show this great love to those people we were in charge of. And again, for those guys that were coached by him, he taught you all to be great teammates and just looking out to you today. Just so proud of all of you and so proud of that relationship that you had with Coach. And if you were asked today what his impact on society was, he would probably have downplayed it, but we would all know better. He had a huge impact on certainly the college game, life, Philadelphia, Temple University. And I'm gonna, last, lastly, uh, you're going to watch a, a video from John Calipari in a moment here. And just thinking about that, in 1994, when that incident happened with Coach and John Calipari, could we all be thinking that this could possibly happen today, that on the day of, the, of his service, that John Calipari would be on film and be here today, this morning, flew in from Kentucky uh, this morning to be here to, to honor his friend, uh, John Cheney. And that's what life's about. That's what be college basketball is about. That's what forgiving is all about. And uh, this guy showed us all how to do that. So rest in peace, my friend. Thank you. Bruiser Flint Bruiser walked Flint. in my office and looked at me and said, Coach Cheney passed away. Took my breath away. Emotionally, I was a wreck all day. And you know why? Because of the memories it brought back. Coach Cheney was a good man, an honorable man, a teacher at heart, a giver, funny, not when he was coaching. A funny man that looked to pick people up. Was never afraid to speak his mind and stand for what was right. I'm saying this to all of you here, you all know that. But what he did for me, he made me a better coach, a coach with a foundation at a young age. If you weren't ready to play his teams, you got beat. If you weren't ready to coach against the zone, you got beat. I walked in the league and said, they're number one in the country. Why can't we be number one? Everybody laughed at me. We took on his mantra, any team, any time, any place. I know I stole it from him, but I gave him credit. The competitiveness of those games, I'll be honest, haven't seen it since. 
He taught his players life lessons. His players that went to the NBA lasted a long time. I'm trying to copy all that. I can't ever be Coach Cheney. I'm not going to play a whole lot of zone either. But what he did for people around him, his staff, his secretary, all the people, what he did with respect. Coach Cheney was a good man. When I was going into the Hall of Fame, I asked him to stand with me. Um, he said, Coach, I'm just not up to it. I really want to, but I can't. I don't want to travel. And he said, but don't let them take you off that stage. They'll try to wave you off. Just keep talking. I said, how long did you go? I don't know, but it was a long time. And they, try, I w they tried to give me the hook. Don't let them. And he laughed, that big bellowing laugh. And I said, Coach, you know they're going to show that ha uh, post game of you coming after me for the next 100 years. He said, yeah, I know. And I said, do you understand if you'd have gotten to me, I was a lot younger than you. Oh, I'd have kicked your ass. No, he would have kicked my ass. I miss my friend. But he'll live on with everything I do from this point on. Thanks, Coach. I love you. I'd like to thank the Cheney family and Bill Ellaby for giving me this opportunity to speak about my friend, John Cheney. John Cheney the man, John Cheney the legend. To know him was to love him. Anyone who ever had the opportunity to meet John always felt that they were important because he made everybody feel important. No matter who you were or what your feelings were, John Cheney made you feel important. I had the privilege to call John my friend. Our friendship goes back over 54 years. I was a teacher starting out at Simon Gratz High School, and I, I'm here today hopefully to speak for the Gratz family and the Philadelphia Public League. I first started in 1967 when I met John. I was an appointed teacher, first year, in a high school. He took me under his wings. At that time, believe it or not, that's when education and physical education was very important. We had over 20 physical education teachers at Simon Gratz High School. Charlie Lotson, Ina Newman, uh, Mickey Stevens, my good, my good friend, uh, Bruce Schumer, principal, first principal at uh, Martin Luther King High School, Lou DeVicaris, and my great friend, Bill Ellaby. Thank you, Bill, for getting me this opportunity to speak here today. I always felt important when I went to Gratz because the Gratz family made me feel important. They made me feel at home. John was a friend of mine and a, probably a bigger friend of my mother. My mother grew up in the South and they had a liking to, Maybe it was because of the Southern cooking. I think it had to do a little bit with John, and I don't know how many people knew about it, but he, he was a waiter at one time. He, he, he worked for a Jewish caterer, and he always would get on me and ask me about, what's this gefilte fish thing? He, he never quite understood about gefilte fish. So my mother would make, a, would make him some food every time he would come over her house, and they had a great relationship. He was very instrumental in my career as a teacher and a coach. He was my mentor and my friend. A couple of quick stories uh, I'd like to tell. One, the very first time I ever went out with my wife, John went with me. We went to the pub. We, it wasn't a real date uh, per se, but I had met her a couple of weeks before and one of the phys ed teachers from Gratz being funny, met her and her girlfriend walking by Kamak Street. And he, he happened to say to her, oh, what would you do? Can you show two guys from out of town a, a, a place to go? So we went 
to uh, a place, a bar in that area. And for first two weeks when I met her and I went out on a date with her, she always thought I was from Kansas City, Kansas. And it was an interesting situation because she worked at Temple. I was a Temple grad. I'm very proud to say that. I played football here at Temple and I, I loved Temple University. But John went with me and he was my backup man. He, he backed me up in all my stories and I was able to get away with it for a couple of weeks. Another quick story was I was probably the only coach who coached cadet basketball who worked with the varsity. I didn't know very much about basketball and when John started out he was the JV coach at Gratz and then the coach before him retired and John took over a team that was, I think they won one game that year. And John said, I want you to be my assistant coach. And he took me under his wing and I coached with him. Believe it or not, we, we worked together, a ninth grade team uh, working with the varsity. And I'll never forget, the first game I, I sat on a bench with them because the JVs, it was a home and away. So the, if the varsity team played at home, the JVs went away. So I would sit on a bench with John and I guess about five minutes into the game, John goes, starts yelling and screaming and jumps up and down on the sideline, like on the bench. What's I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? He gets up into the face of the official, starts yelling and screaming at the official, walks away, and he gives me a wink. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> you know, he's winking at me, and I'm a young coach. I would never, you know, even think about even talking to an official, let alone jumping up and down. After the game, uh, we went to the pub, get, get some milk, I guess, uh, whatever it was. <laughs> anyway, he said, he said, Ron, I'm not fighting about that call. I'm, I'm working on the next call. And that's what, that's what John Cheney did. He, he was working, he always knew the angle. He played the percentages and he worked the officials and he was able to make good players great players. He was able to make average players good players. That's what John had in his ability to do as a teacher. And it's been mentioned many times before, he was a teacher, a great teacher. Not only, not only did he teach kids, but he took young coaches like myself and made me a better coach and more importantly, a better person. John, you will be missed. You will never be forgotten. I will always have you in my heart, John, my friend, rest in peace. I love you. You know, it's really hard to put into words the impact that Coach Cheney has had in the city of Philadelphia. He was more than a coach. He was a teacher who instilled confidence, leadership, and the will to succeed for countless student athletes at Temple University and beyond. His fiery temper made him famous and I loved it, but his kindness off the court is how I will remember him best. Thank you, Coach, for everything you did for the sport of basketball, our youth, and the people of Philadelphia. We're going to miss you. Rest in peace, Coach. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Stoner. I've, I'm here on behalf of Coach Vivian Stringer. She's asked me to read a statement. This is obviously a very emotional time for her. She and John Cheney coached together at Cheney State for a number of years, and that's when I first met John. I guess it was back in 1975 or so. I came to Cope Hall in Cheney State College and uh, John, I met for the first time, and we talked and developed a friendship over the last 40 some years, and we always stayed in touch. Um, and I wanted to digress before I read the statement by, by Coach. Uh, it's Black History Month, and I think I'd like to make note of the fact that when John was coaching at Cheney, and they won the national championship in 78, 79 season, Vivian was coaching at Cheney as well with the women's team. And it was interesting because John left Cheney and he went to Temple University, and when I would see Peter Lee, of course, the president of Temple at that time, I would say, uh, 
Mr. Lee, of course, you know, it was great that you hired John Cheney, but you left the other half of the best coaching tandem in the country at Cheney State. Sure enough, John left Cheney and went to, uh, uh, and went to uh, Temple. She left Cheney and went to the University of Iowa. Eight years later, they were both number one in the country, 1988. Cheney was number one, Temple was number one. So I want to acknowledge that because we had two treasure troves at Cheney State uh, in John and Vivian. John and I developed a friendship. John's first player ever to be drafted was Andrew Fields from Cheney State, who I represented uh, because of that friendship I had with John. And I never forgot the words of wisdom that he imparted to me. Um, at this point, I'd like to read a statement prepared by Coach Stringer uh, to the family and to John. On behalf of my family, my team, and all of my players, I have been privileged to coach over the years. Good afternoon to all of you. Through me, we stand together, we stand tall to thank and honor our beloved Coach John Cheney. The memories I have of Coach are as rich, diverse, and beautiful as John's good life. My own family never let me down, but Coach Cheney was the person who put me on the path to success in our shared profession. At many levels, John was the single most important individual responsible, responsible for the person I grew up to be. I have been blessed to lead this life and I was blessed to meet Coach almost 48 years ago. All of the success I have known was due to his teaching, his tutelage, and invaluable uh, mentorship. You may not know or even recognize it, but I am proud to say that I, am modeled my, I have modeled my coaching style on his. On the court, we thought alike, we taught alike, we practiced alike, and our philosophical conversations on basketball fundamentals were both epic and enlightening. We should all acknowledge and honor the monumental legacy Coach Cheney left for us. First among these was the bold, sometimes fearless voice he carried on behalf of his pure African-American coaches. Equally, perhaps most important, he never shied away from speaking up for those who rarely could speak for themselves. Coach wanted everyone to have an equal opportunity to succeed in college and in life, regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds, lack of resources or obstacles to educational success. He would often say, don't raise the ceiling without raising the floor, and he fought for what was best for all student athletes. John did not just say inspirational things, he did inspirational things. He did not, he did not just pay lip service, he stepped up and made his actions speak louder than his words. He lived his life in accordance with what he believed. Coach Cheney was a father, a friend, leader, a mentor, hero, humanitarian, and a talented athlete, and an iconic, often imitated, but never quite duplicated kind of basketball coach. He was a powerful force for truth and change. I believe that if I, we, can carry forth just a little part of what Coach stood for, we will honor him as he would have wished. I join John's family, his world of friend, friends, and generations of players when I say that I will carry him in my heart and soul forever. His presence in my life was transformational, and the time we spent together was priceless. I hope his family knows that I am forever indebted to him and, and them for, what, for all that he gave me in our friendship. We all share in a great loss. Thank you. Good afternoon. My deep, deepest condolences, sincere condolences to the Cheney family for your loss of your loved one. We mourn with you. All the speakers before me, it, it, it was almost like they knew what I was going to present today because they all seem to be saying the same thing about this great man, John Cheney. Coach Cheney was a person who just wanted to be remembered as a person who cared. But I'm here to tell you today, that's just a microcosm of what he meant to so many people. 
The story of Cheney University has seen the faded away, but I'm here to shine a light on that today because that's where he began before, prior to coming here. His stomping grounds, he got his teeth cut, as we say, if he was a baby, at Cheney State College in Cheney, Pennsylvania. And that seems to go unnoticed a lot. Coach Cheney was a coach, he's a mentor, he's an educator, he was a great humanitarian, he was a shepherd, he was a surrogate father, and most of all, more importantly, he was our friend, and we love him. Everyone on the grounds of Cheney University, when we heard of his passing, the Cheney University websites erupted, erupted. All kinds of condolences and memories and pictures, pictures I haven't even seen before. And I do know that, I want to share with you, one Saturday, one of our cheerleaders who coached placed in, in charge of us once he left to come to Temple University because he felt as though that that championship team I'm not going to say what he really said, but I'll use another word, that we were like inept and we needed supervision. <laughs> and so he placed her in charge of us. And we talked, and she took on, she's a, she's a hammer, and she took on that role almost 38 years now. Anytime we wanted to connect with Coach Cheney, he would contact her, she would get the information to us, and whether it was meeting him at Chili's on Sea Line Avenue or any affair that we meant to go to, that was our liaison person. And so, uh, so I'm here to say that on, at Cheney University, he was huge. I heard a couple of individuals before me speak and indicate that Cheney was a person, Coach Cheney was a person that gave opportunities to individual athletes like myself who would even have gotten the chance at bigger institutions of higher learning. He would go deep. He would go deep into these neighborhoods, drug-infested, individuals on a so low socioeconomic level, gang-related neighborhoods, and pluck these individuals out those neighborhoods, dust them off, dust them off, smooth the rough edges, and, and give them an opportunity, forget the basketball, for an education first, because he was strong on that. And I'm one of those individuals standing here before you today. And so it behooves me that individuals who are in these positions to look back and help those individuals like myself. Because without John Cheney, I'd probably be dead or doing a long time in jail. Okay? We can't make it too. We just need opportunities and a chance. That's all. Just a chance. Open the door and let us, let us in. One of the things that is mentioned, but it's mentioned as if an afterthought. And it was, to me, it was a gigantic experience. Now, at Cheney University, I mean, today, because it Cheney State back then, but I'm going to refer to Cheney University in the present, is that the basketball program, Coach Cheney has, and, and C. Vivian Stringer, they were the athletic department. They were the athletic budget. And they carried all the other athletic programs because they were winners. One of the strategies, and I couldn't understand it because I was a freshman on that team coming in, is that Coach Cheney would play most of the games away from school. We had a fan base that we got in the gym and standing room only, but we didn't play a lot of games at home. And I was saying, That's, there's an advantage to that. Little did I know there was an advantage to playing on the road also because you go into these hostile territories and play, and prepared you for the postseason. And we went in some places that we weren't really welcome real well. And it was so bad at times that we had to have police escorts from the hotels to the games and back. Black jelly beans thrown at you, pennies, obscenities shouted at you. We went through all that as kids. I couldn't understand it because I'm from North Philly. I'm from down the street here by 18th of Columbia Avenue. It seems to be more now. So I was raised around there. So I didn't understand what the heck was going on. But we weren't really welcome. But I can tell you this here, though, today, I can stand it in front of you today and say this. Couldn't do much about that. But that team that came between those lines, they had, they had a problem. They had a problem. That problem was Cheney State at college at the time, basketball players, because we took that out on them. 
and we persevered. We persevered. John Cheney, Coach Cheney, the conference championships were something of the past since we always won that. We was undefeated in the conference that year. You know, we get out of the States, you go to the, 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 the uh, Sweet 16. But I want to just start on 78 at the, um, the Elite Eight. We're up at Yale University, going up against Sacred Heart University, barn burner. Score is 55 55. We had the possessions, a few seconds left in the game. I think it was five or six seconds left in the game. We had the possession. The coach draws us to play. We had a guy, a gentleman on the team, Jeffrey Hutchinson. He was deadly from either corner. It was like a layup. He wouldn't miss. And so the play was set up to go to him. Well, you know we had a five-second count. Jeff drew a double team. They knew it. He drew a double team. Andrew Fields, who was the tournament MVP, popped out to the right elbow. Pass came into him. It was a catch and shoot. Squared up, shot it, kissed off the glass, and it was pandemonium broke out. Everybody was jumping and shouting, oh, we made it. We got our ticket. We're going to the Final Four. But let me just say something to you. That celebration was short-lived. Because when we got back to Cope Hall, it was a difference in Coach Cheney at the time. He was focused. He was preparing us for the big show, and he told us very simply, we're not going, we played up the Southwest Missouri State up here in, um, in the Ozark Mountains, in Southwest Missouri. And he, told, he said, listen, we're not going up there just being happy to be there. That's not what we're doing. We're going there to win. And so our whole perspective on that elite, that elite eight game vanished, and we were preparing to go into battle. We're not happy to be there. No, we're going there to win. When we played that championship game against University of Green Bay, Wisconsin, who's, who had two legit seven-footers. So Andrew Fields and Roger Lace have had their job cut out for them, because they weren't seven-foot. They were six, eight, six, nine. One of the strategies were keep them guys off that little box, push them out from that floor, make them put that ball down so we can get a chance to take it from them. They was uncomfortable there, but on that box, they would have killed us. And so that happened. However, at the end of the second half, we had a low period where we couldn't score. Scoring was at a minimum. Coach called on this young man who played the least amount of minutes the whole season than anybody on the team. His name is Kenny Hisson. We call him, we call him Cisco. They called him. He had, I'm you, he had the least amount of minutes the whole season. And I don't know what Coach saw, but he called the right number. Because he came in the game and he hit like six straight jumpers from the top of the key. He lit them up. And that lead that we, we, we acquired, we held on and sustained, and it propelled us to the a national championship in which um, Kenny Henson actually was the, uh, he made the first team all, all tournament, and Andrew Fields uh, was the MVP, who again was drafted number two by the Portland Trailblazers. And so what I'm saying in essence is this this group of guys, one group of guys who were born with a golden spoon in their mouth. These are guys that coach picked up, had an interest in, and basically molded them to be what they are today. Now, when we found out that Coach Cheney had accepted the job at Temple, we had mixed feelings about that. But it was encouraging because he was going on to bigger things. And I can, I can sit here and tell you today that every game that, that Temple played, we, especially me, I can tell you now, we was watching the game because when he first came here, the systems were the same. So I'm watching to see who is not doing their assignments right, who's missing the pick, who's throwing that ball away, or who's not doing what they're supposed to do. So I'm sitting there analyzing the game. So Temple became an extension of us because of Coach Cheney, especially the players in the system. They, they tweaked it a little bit, but when he first got there, they were basically the same system. Um, so so what, what I, I guess I'm saying that this is that you know, we both, I mean, Temple and Cheney University has experienced the greatness of this great man, but I don't want it to go unnoticed where he began, where he began. Amen. And he began at Cheney University for 10 years, and we cherish that. And I can say this here, and it's not a real good thing, but we have not basically rebounded from the loss of John Cheney and C. Vivian Stringer since it's been over almost 40 years. That's how special these two individuals was to our program. 
Now, when John Cheney took his last breath, his spirit ascended to the heavens and the earthen vessel that he used while he was on earth is here today. And I can honestly tell you that I know he's here, I know he's looking down on us, and this is a celebration of life. And so you know, we cherish that, we miss him and we mourn with the family, but we feel blessed to have been in the presence and taught by such a man. 1981, again, get, just going back, we knew he was leaving, but he didn't leave. He had the opportunity to leave, but he didn't leave. He stayed one more year. And he stayed that one more year because he wanted every member of that championship team to get that degree. And my, my roommate, Charles Murphy, was the last one to graduate in 82. And when he graduated, that's when Coach accepted the position at Temple and left. I'm just the one voice here today for the institution that taught me, Cheney University. And so what I did was I said, well, how can I be the voice for some of the others who don't have this particular platform. And so what I, through Pam West, we got together and I said, well, you know what we can do? Pamela West, because she told me to say Pamela. So forgive me, Pamela West. She said, I said, well, no, I think we, this is what we can do. It's like a brief synopsis of comments that we can have individuals who, some of the players, just submit an expression of gratitude. And so I do have that today, bear with me, I know the time that I am between the lines, but I'm not out of bounds yet. So. We're so, getting close. Yeah, yeah, I, honestly, I got you. I know you was coming. I know you was coming, but I'm not out of bounds yet. We're getting there. So, expressions of gratitude. Joe Izzy, our trainer. Coach, thanks for all your positive influence towards me and the lives you have touched. You made our lives better and more beautiful. Rest in peace. Andrew Fields. We lost a great man of, of the basketball world. He was a father figure, a mentor friend. He created a men's, woman's hood of love through basketball. Thanks, coach. Kenny Henson, I'm grateful for everything you've done for us as a team and individuals. You reassured me that good things come to those who wait. But be prepared when your time comes. I was and I am prepared. Thanks, coach. Jeffrey Hutchison, thanks, Coach, for, be, for believing in me as a basketball player. Playing varsity three years without being recruited, you provided me an opportunity to receive a college degree and a winning, and winning on a national Division II championship team. Rest in, rest in paradise, Coach. Roger Lasef, thanks, Coach. Promise made to my mother, promise kept. 1979 graduate from Cheney University, you kept your word. Michael Blackshear. Thank you, Coach, for putting your name on the line for me as I was lost and confused. Now I am a man of principle and integrity without, with empathy forever. Keith Johnson, Coach, is responsible for me being the man that I am today. Thanks, Coach. Pamela West, thanks, Coach, for taking the cheerleaders under your wing and adding to the excitement regarding our college experience before you were the hashtag, you were a girl dad. Pastor Dwayne Coleman, coach you taught me that life is a lot of work. You asked me what it is that gives me strength to continue when we are tired and burnt out. You said sometimes an inspirational idea can help us renew ourselves and be filled with strength to fulfill our life purpose. You said inspiration comes in many forms, however, the root of all inspiration is the idea that our lives are meaningful and fulfill your life purpose. Debbie Walker, one of the Lady Wolves. Coach was the epitome of how a male coach can and should unshamedly support and motivate women in sports. Cope Hall was our sanctuary, and daily Coach Cheney delivered an inspirational sermon about life, the importance of education and basketball. Thanks, Coach Cheney, for sharing your knowledge. We're all better as a result of your sharing. We love you, Coach, your Lady Wolves. And 
and I write, thank you, Coach, for providing me an opportunity to receive a quality education and to be a member of a national championship team and all of the life-ish lessons that you taught me. In conclusion, Coach Cheney has gone on to glory, but he will live in each and every one of us through the spirit, his spirit, the interactions we've had through him through the years, and that's how he will live in each and one of us. God bless the Cheney family, but we continue to lift you up in prayer, and God bless us to each and every one of you. Thank you. Amen. day for all of us. Um, losing someone like Coach Cheney, who meant so much to all of us, is devastating. And I, I chose to send this message while hearing the balls bouncing in the background, because I know this was a sacred place for him. And it's a sacred place for all of us. It is the very reason why I got the chance to meet him, I got a chance to be mentored by him. I got a chance to learn from him, not just basketball, but so many life lessons that I'm truly proud of. To the family, the Cheney family, I am super sorry that you love such an important father, husband, friend. Um, but I know, just like us, he left you all with some great memories. And I'm gonna hang on to those memories uh, for the rest of my life. Coach Cheney, I absolutely adore you. May heaven smile upon you. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Englert and Temple University uh, for hosting this celebration of life to our head coach, John Cheney. Uh, my condolences to the Cheney family. I want to thank you guys for allowing us to be a part of your lives for so long. Um, I'm at peace. I'm at peace. Because he was at peace. If, if you told me right now that I can live to be 89, sign me up, sign me up. These tough times that we face now, tomorrow is not promised. So enjoy it while you have it. Enjoy it while you have it. Coach was built on morals and values. He fought for educating the youth, me being one of them. Coach fought for what was right. He was our coach, our teacher, our advocate. So many words I can use to describe the man. But the one that's most fitting for me is strength. I had a conversation with a friend one day. And we was talking about family and life. And I asked him, how do you see your kid's future? And he said to me, my grandfather walked 10 miles to work every day. My father walked five. I'm driving a Cadillac. My son is in a Mercedes. He said my grandson will be in a Ferrari. But he said my great grandson will be walking again. So I asked him, I said, well, why is that? And he said to me, tough times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. Weak men create tough times. He said to me, many will not understand, but you have to raise warriors. That's what coach instilled in me and so many like me. The strength and courage of a warrior. Temple and Coach Cheney took a chance on me, stressing the importance of education, humility, and leadership. 
Why do those things matter? It matters to me because it changed the course of my life. It changed my family lives and everyone that's connected to me. He helped me get a seat at the table and now I'll have the distinguished honor of being called coach, the leader of young men. I've endured some tough times in my life, but when you have strong men in your corner, they empower you with the strength and courage of a warrior. Coach, you gave me that opportunity at life, the one I always wanted. No more, no less. Everything I am today is because of you. I love you. May you rest in peace and strength. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Jackson. Uh, we all here, we know why we're here, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but I would say to the Cheney family, you know, uh, what can I say that has not been said? What can I say that we're not all feeling? I'm sorry that we lost such a great man, but you know, he was loved. How many? Temple University Hospital is where I was born. Raised on Temple's campus from birth. Chose to go away to school because I felt as though my life was too hard and I wanted to run from it. So I went to Virginia Commonwealth University as a freshman. After the first week, realized bad decision. Got to get back home. Came back home. My mother was battering demons, raising my little brother. <laughs> Got to the point where I pretty much raised my little brother in the dorms. But all with that being said, I had Coach John Cheney. The word coach means dad to me. I'll never forget a conversation I had with Coach after an incident in college versus Duke University. Being raised by a single mother, and pretty much a lot of times being raised by yourself or raising yourself, you don't learn to cope with certain things. You don't learn how to control certain emotions. Versus a certain team, certain things were said to me that made me angry. I'd never been called certain things in my life, and I didn't know how to handle it. So I lost my cool. Lady guy out with an elbow. The next day, I was told to apologize. Wrote a little letter, state my apology. <laughs> Gave it to John DeSango first to read, and he looked at it, then looked at me, and <laughs> then ran to coach. He said, coach, look what Mark's about to say. And, co <laughs> and coach uh, called me in his office, and then once again, coach, meaning dad, called me in his office. He read my letter, he said, I know you're mad because you've never heard these things said to you before. I was like, you're absolutely right, coach. I'm ticked. Day after the game, I'm ticked, I'm mad, I'm furious. Why am I feeling this way? Never raised with a dad, never was taught how to cope with certain things, certain emotions. And coach sat me down in his office, he told John, leave, leave. So I left, he left. And he sat me down and he's had some inspiring words that a father, teaches a child and teaches him how to cope with certain things. And that's to me what good fathers do. They teach you. They don't tell you what you want to hear. 
they teach you right for wrong and how to cope with things. How to not just cope with that situation, but situations that's going to occur later in your life. Why? Because they've been there, they've done that. You can learn from the oldest people knowledge that they're giving back to you. So from that time on, I said, Coach, you're absolutely right. So further on, further past that, Coach and I have developed a big bond. That game, a game I was suspended because of my actions. Coach set out the game with me. And a lot of my counterparts, the people asked me, why do you sit out with you? And I just, and Coach just said, you don't got to explain yourself, but we know what we're doing. And that day that Coach set out with me, that was like a father taking a child to a drive to now teach him how to become a man. I, um, I started my, I moved to Tampa, Florida. I have three biological kids. When well, people ask me how many children I have, I say 90. Because that's how many children I have involved that I mentor every single week. 90 young men from all over from Philadelphia, people that drive to my program from New York, from Harrisburg, never late, has never missed a practice, never missed a mentor session, just never. I have kids, when I first retired, I moved to Tampa, Florida, that call me every single day to ask for my advice. Some of them call me dad, because the word coach means dad. Some of them call me with good news, some of them call me with bad news, but what I do is I teach them I said, let me teach you how to cope with certain things. Every last one of the players that have come through my program, they know majority of the coach's story. Some of them they can't know, but uh, they know majority of them. <laughs> when I first transferred back to Temple, I knew, like, once again, I found a father that I never had. I knew once again I could learn, and I did. But Temple, being born in Temple's hospital, being raised in Temple's campus, thinking it was a better life for me somewhere else, always came back. With the VCU, came back. Moved to Florida, came back. So, as the Cheney family should know, he's touched hundreds, and he's touched thousands because of what he instilled in us, and we give it back. We thank you for sharing him with us, but I'll tell you my three biological children and all 90 of the kids that call me their dad slash coach know every single thing that coach has taught me, has taught every member that's ever been a part of his program. Because we know life is bigger than bouncing a ball. It's much bigger, but we use the ball as a tunnel to get into their mind. And we let them know we're tough, but we're loving. And Coach loved me as well as every single person in here, and you know that. And we say thank you for sharing him with us. And his legacy will live on forever. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I first, Maria, can you come up, please? Um, as we all know, Coach Cheney touched so many people and had so many fans. Um, I was blessed with the, the opportunity to present this to the family. Um, a local artist put this portrait together, and what makes it so special is that it's made from every player from 1982 to 2006. So I want to present this to you guys. Here's a letter on the back. Yes, on the top. <laughs> That's beautiful. How much time do I have? Let me ask that question. Two minutes? Okay. That's funny. That's funny. You can't put my name on the bro on the program and give me two minutes. Um, just two quick stories. You know, we're gonna hear so many stories about Coach and in the media. We've been sharing them. I've been reading them. But you know, just like Aaron said earlier. Um, you know, I'm at ease. Coach lived the way he, his life the way he wanted to live, and I can only wish to have the impact on this many people across the world that Coach had. 
So um, hopefully I'm able to lighten the moment a little bit and um, br bring the essence of Coach Cheney here today. Um, Aaron, you talked about Cheney University. I'm from Simon Gratz, where also Coach Cheney started at. Well, he started at Sayre, then he went to Simon Gratz. I was blessed to be the coach at Simon Gratz six years ago. And the, one of the first people I called was Coach Cheney, obviously. And the first thing he said to me was, don't F it up. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what he said. And he also said to me, you know, you better teach them kids what I taught you. And teach them kids about life, teach them discipline, and you'll be okay. Um, so about two years ago now with the pandemic going on, Coach L can attest to this, uh, we had a wonderful season. Uh, we actually was able to make it here to play in the championship game. So after the championship game, we was able to make it to the States. So we had a little bit of time to prepare for the States. You know, all week long, we're going over our, our temple zone, which is our matchup zone. Everybody, all the players know, know what that is. We, I'm working on Rover because I'm telling the team, look, the team that we're playing, they're going to be disciplined. They're going to pass the ball. They're going to make all the right plays. And so because it's the States, I had a good friend of mine named Randy. He said, y'all want to do a story on you guys. You guys had a spectacular year. I'm going to come in at halftime. I'm going to talk to you after the game. Perfect. We played his first state game, and we are getting our behinds kicked. They doing everything that they, I told them, my team, that they was going to do. We doing everything that I told us not to do. Get out on shooters. We're not getting there. A rover in the back. The ball over here, rover over there. The players know what that means. He's over there. He should be on this side of the ball. Um, so we get into halftime. And Randy comes up, you know, with his microphone, and he says, um, hey, you know, I want to record your halftime speech. So I told him, I said, well, you know, it's not going to be real long. So he says, um, all right, well, you know, I'm ready. I said, all right, it's only going to be like, you know, 10 seconds. So I get in there, and I just tell the team, like, hey, look, if y'all don't win this game, we're going to be fighting on the bus. <laughs> and I left back out. Randy was like, oh, wow. Second half, no turnovers, Rovers playing the right way. We wind up winning that game, right? Randy comes up to me after the game for his interview, and he's being funny. He said, hey, um, you're Coach Cheney Jr. <laughs> so I said, what? what are you talking about? He said, Lenard, do you not understand that in the first quarter you threw your sweater behind the bench, <laughs> you broke your clipboard, <laughs> You went through five markers. Um, you, you, do you remember what you said to the team at halftime? <laughs> and, you know, I was like, well, can you give me the stats of the game? He said, yeah, second half, y'all turned the ball over twice. Y'all created tough shots. I said, well, did we win? He said, yeah. I said, well, I guess I'm Coach Cheney. <laughs> um, my second story is, is very special because when I came to Temple, my mom like Mark said, my mom was so crucial to me in my life at that time. Um, I was highly recruited, and Coach L probably remembers this. Um, Coach L told me to go straight home from school. Somebody from Temple University would be there for a home visit. So I, get, I catch the bus home. My house is adjacent from the bus stop. So I'm walking, I get off the bus, I see a bunch of guys you know, crowded in front of my home, and I walk over, and first thing I notice is that beautiful 850 BMW that Coach used to have, as we all remember. And so, you know, the guys are excited for me. Oh, you know, Coach Cheney is, Coach Cheney is here. So, you know, I'm about to go in the house, and, he, and it got, one of the guys say, hey, he told us we better not touch his damn car. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I get into the house, you know, I, 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 I'm expecting to be, you know, greeted. You know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm being recruited. And I get in there, and my mom is sitting with a big brown warm bag of peanuts from the Redden Terminal. And he, she and Coach Cheney are sitting there going through her herb book, talking about herbs. And Coach Cheney turns and looks at me and says, are you taking your herbs like your mom tell you? And I say, yes, I'm taking them, Coach. We talk a little bit of basketball. And as he's leaving now, I walk into his car and he yells to all the guys, I hope y'all better not be touching my damn car. 
And so that was 1990, early part of 1994. Um, later, after I made the temple, I mean, that was early 1994, walked the guys out, <clears throat> walked Coach Cheney out, come back in the house. My mom is sitting there eating the peanuts, and she says, you going to the temple. <laughs> so I choose to come to the temple. I know this date because all the players remember this date. October 15th, 1994 was the first day of practice that we had. Coaches going over roles, responsibilities, and we're about to get into the first drill. And so getting to the first drill, and obviously we're in McGonagall Hall, much bigger than here, much smaller than here. And I hear I hear my name called. And only one other one person I know at that time can call my name that way, which was my mom. You can hear it from miles away. I'm pretty sure everybody recognized that your mom called you from miles away, you just stop and you, it just chill goes through your body. And you just automatically, it almost forces you to just turn around. And so that first practice, that first drill, I don't know what I did, I might have made a mistake and I hear that, that, that sound. And I, I turn around and it's Coach Cheney standing with my mom with a bag of peanuts. <laughs> laughing, you know he does that. <laughs> He laughing, so I come over. He said, yeah, I just want He's And it was Coach Shane who, who yelled my name. And I come over, he said, I just want to see if I got it right. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I got to go through four years of this stuff with this man. Um, but that was, that was special to me. But um, I put some words together real fast, and hopefully it embellishes who he was and is similar to what everybody else was saying. Um, you know, because I always heard that that voice, even when I was away in Europe playing basketball, it just reminded me to, I got to call coach. When I would hear that and get that feeling, I got to call coach. When I'm coaching the last couple of years, I would hear that, I got to call coach. Um, when he passed, that voice, I just heard it every day. And when I found out that I was going to be able to come speak, I heard it again, clear as day. I actually had to pull over my vehicle and I heard it. And I, I, I asked him, I said, um, you know, what, what do I say? You know, what do you say? So, you know, what do you say about a man who was full of so many words? What do you say about a man who touched so many souls? What do you say about a man who meant so much to so many? What do you say about a man who created so many memories? What do you say about a man who impacted so many communities? What do you say about a man we all come to know and love? What do you say about a man who took so many chances on so many of us? What do you say about a man who stood for young people and those who couldn't stand? What do you say about a man who put so, so much on his shoulders and never stopped being that man? What do you say about a man who demanded that no matter what, we always took care of one another? What do you say about a man who wanted you to make sure you put temple first and others second, never forgetting our tradition and our histories, history rather? What do you say about a man who was always present and urged that you did the same? What do you say about a man who taught you guidance, discipline, and accountability to anyone who crossed his path? What do you say about a man who always was able to make you laugh? What do you say about a man who was wise as the temple owl what do you say about a man who was a Hall of Famer, not just in basketball, but in life? What do you say about a man who taught us all that winning is an attitude? What do you, talk, what do you say about a man who taught us all about 5.30 a.m.? <laughs> what do you say about a man who knew how to tell you, who knew how to yell your name like your mother could? What do you say about a man who taught you how to win over and over and over? I think 70, 741 to be exact. What do you say about a teacher who taught you how to play the game of basketball and the game of life? What do you say about a man who was Philadelphia's coach? What do you say about a man who made the matchup zone a mystery? What do you say about a man who is black history? What do you say about a man who lived his life the way he wanted? What do you say about a man who made the cry, who made the world cry when he decided to go? Well, what do you say? You say thank you. Thank you for your love to gave. Thank you for your guidance. 
Thank you for always being a teacher of life. Thank you for making sure let, to let us all know that you was always right. <laughs> Thank you for the discipline. Thank you for always shining your light. Thank you for the stories that taught us all lessons of life. Thank you for teaching us to live life with a purpose. Um, I, you, we got to say thank you to Temple University and Peer Little Chorus for taking a chance on Coach Cheney because that's what they did. What do you say to the family? You say thank you because you guys allow him to be in our lives. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure he gave up so much of to be with you guys, to be with us. So we say thank you. What do you say about a man <clears throat> who came in to learn and served? Well, that man is my coach and your coach. We say we love you. And I say thank you for buying my mom some peanuts. <laughs> afternoon. Uh, first, my deepest condolences and to Mrs. Cheney and the Cheney family. Thank you so much for sharing, Coach, for all these years and all the sacrifices you made. And I am humbled that you would ask me to say a few words. I think anyone that's ever played for Coach will know this. There was a couple things that we always tried to do. Stay off his radar screen in practice. That was practically my major. And to try to make him proud. And I certainly hope I can make him proud today. But I first, I wanted to tell a quick story about Coach's brilliance and how his mind thinks. You know, he used to say, never pass up a teaching moment. You may never get it back. So the team was flying back from UCLA, heading to Boston to play UMass. We had a layover in Chicago. Anytime we had a layover or downtime in an airport, Howard Evans and Tim Perry would make a beeline for the arcade, play Miss Pac-Man. If you've ever been to O'Hare, it's, it's pretty big, and I, I don't think they realized just how far away they wandered from the gate. Fast forward a little bit, they were starting to reboard our plane. No sign of Howard or Tim. Over the intercom, the lady was boarding the plane, people that need assistance, first class, and so on. Still no sign of our point guard and our shot blocker. The team starts milling around, talking, looking around, looking around the, around the concourse. Finally, Coach realizes something's just not right. He asks, he asks our manager, Rob Jones, what's going on. Rob had to tell him. As soon as, as soon as Rob told him, Coach jumped up, urging our team and the last few passengers, strangers, to get on the plane. He's practically herding us down the jetway. He gets onto the plane. He's making an announcement. Sit down. Fasten your seatbelts. He's urging the flight attendants to shut the door. He's yelling up to the cockpit, to the pilots, put this thing in reverse. Let's go. Back out of the gate. He wanted to leave him in Chicago, and we did. He knew the psychological effect of being left behind, not knowing the punishment and having to think about it for four or five hours would be gut-wrenching. So they arrive in Boston on the next flight. Rob had to stay back with a rental car. 
pick them up, take them to the hotel. And all along the way, Howie and Tim, is Coach mad? How mad is he? What, what was he saying? And Rob is like, yeah, he's mad. So they arrive at the hotel, and, and Slick Howie says, Rob, go around to the back of the hotel. Go around the, the back entrance. So he does. They get out of the car. They go in through the back. Guess who's sitting there waiting for him? Coach. He had a few choice words, and I think they went right up to the room. And, uh, you know, he never missed an opportunity. The first time I saw Coach was probably 40 years ago. I was in high school. I was at a, went to a Palestra doubleheader. At halftime, Coach was strangling the, the coach from the other team. <laughs> True story. The last time I saw him was January 26th. Uh, me and a bunch of my teammates had a video call. And after some laughs and some stories, he said some things I don't think any of us will ever forget. He said, guys, remember what I taught you. Always stay together. No matter what happens, stay together. What a great 40-year ride it's been for me and my teammates. Has anyone in here ever used the words winning is an attitude? Or maybe how you start is how you finish? How about success has a narrow doorway? I'm guessing you have, and probably some others as well. Have you ever told the youth team you coach you have to have teeth in your belly, only for them to look at you, not understanding what the heck you just said. He changed a lot of lives. And Coach, some of Coach is within all of us, every one of us. I've even heard some accounts of people that never met Coach, yet they talk about how he changed their lives. Whether it's the sayings we use, discipline, time management, being a perfectionist, or the countless other qualities, too lengthy to list. We all have some of Coach in us. And you know, Coach never took anything for granted either. I remember one selection Sunday, we gathered as a team, to watch the show. We had, we had won the Atlantic 10 that year, so we were getting an automatic bid. Temple was the very last team they called that day. And towards the end, Coach was pacing, hands in his hair. He was convinced the NCAA may have changed the rules on automatic bids, and Al Schreier didn't tell him. <laughs> Patience was not a virtue, maybe. As a player, I think I speak for all of us when I say the one trait, the one thing that we all talk about is how Coach showed us how much he loved us. It didn't matter what we did in practice or a game. When we crossed over the line, at the end of the day, we knew he loved us, and we loved him. It didn't stop when our playing career ended. Communication was a must. If, we ha if, if Coach hadn't heard from us in a while, we'd get a phone call. I can, I can almost hear it in my head now. Miss Davis, get me Nate. Or Maria, get Mark on the phone. And that's how it was. Coach never thought of himself. It was always about others. And as the years and decades went by, the conversation turned to our kids. Whenever we would talk to him and ask him how he was feeling, he ignored us and wanted to hear about our families. What are our kids doing? How are they doing in school? And he wanted to know about whatever sport they played. When I would talk to him, 
he demanded I pass the phone to my kids. And he would ask my daughter about volleyball, and he would instruct my son not to have any turnovers. No turnovers, Jack, he said. I, I would hear it through the phone from across the room. The number of lives he changed cannot be calculated. At Temple alone, he coached over 100 players. Each and every one's lives have been changed. Now add Sayre Junior High School, Gratz, and Cheney State, and the number of players' lives directly impacted is that much greater. And if he changed our lives, if he changed my life, that means he changed my kids' lives. And in some cases, you could even say grandkids' lives now. The downstream impact will be never ending. He taught through life lessons, and we were lucky enough to be his students. He was relentless in helping those in need, and the world is better for it. Let's continue to honor his memory by passing on those lessons and continuing those deeds. I love you, Coach. Thank you. I'm going to ask that uh, Dr. Dumpson and Frank Mitchell would come forward for the selection now while we gather ourselves for the um, My Second Dad by Melody Messer Van Putin. My 
My soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. My soul, my soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. My soul's been anchored. The billows may toss, the breakers may dash, but I will not move because he holds me fast. Don't be discouraged. In the sky, we'll all understand it by and by. My soul has been anchored in the Lord. Coach Cheney, my second dad. You were a larger-than-life figure, coach extraordinaire and mentor to many. But to me, you were my second dad, your only daughter Pam, my sister still. My weekends at the Cheney house are too numerous to count. Years worth, fried fish, grits, plenty of hot sauce, uproarious laughter, Stories galore, and a bit of mischief, too. Gruff but warm, strong but soft, proud but humble, a giant among giants, showing us and me how to live with passion, courage, and strength unapologetically. You were my second dad, telling folks who knew not, I helped raise that girl. Indeed you did. And this girl, now fully grown, is grateful. You are fiercely loved by your family, friends, legions of players, coaches, fans, and me, your second daughter. I know that the ancestors have welcomed you, arms wide open, a great celebration on the earth planes and heaven too, celebrating a life gloriously lived. May you rest in eternal peace and power. Lovingly submitted, Melody Misheri Van Putten, Bermuda, Ashe. What has not been said? Stories of colleagues from Cadet basketball team's brother Cohen, Aaron, someone who walks in his footsteps, Mark, a coach who became a father, Mr. President, someone who was a steadfast leader on your campus, Fran, someone who blazed a trail for you, and Mike, someone who remembered that it was important that the same thing he sowed inside of you was sowed inside of your volleyball playing daughter. What has not been said? A poem has been read from a far off land. We've been reminded that our souls are anchored in the Lord, Pamela. And Mrs. Cheney, we have been reminded that your husband had a Bible and had you in mind when he, in his own way, highlighted passages of Scripture. The names of Cheney basketball players who he pulled off of 18th and Columbia, now Cecil B. Moore, who might have a preacher inside of him, or two preachers maybe. What has not been said? The stories of John Cheney will go on and on forever. They will outlive him. The evidence that death does not stand a chance against life. I've watched male men cry as they viewed bodies. And I've watched others pause, imagining now how do we move on without the looming presence who has been a fixture, whether at Sayre Middle School or 
Simon Gretz or at Cheney or Temple or carrying peanuts to a mother who wants to know that she is entrusting her child to someone who cares and calls his name the same way. What more can be said about somebody? For me, this is a daunting challenge. I remember Coach Cheney because my brother who sang that song, My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord, was a camper on Cheney's campus, and I remember how hot it used to be up on that blacktop up there when he and Sonny Hill would try to run us to death. What more can be said about someone who has done so many things and now this gaping hole is left for us wondering how God will fill this hole for Temple University and the Cheney family, but even larger than that to this entire city, maybe even larger as John Calipari and other coaches see that this moral force who said that Proposition 48 was something that John Cheney knew that black lives matter before black folks knew that black lives matter. What more do we say about him? The, the best and highest form of flattery is imitation. And in the Gospel of John, and I'm going to set a record for the brevity of a black Baptist preacher at a funeral because I know there are some others who are in my age category who are looking where the bathroom is now. But these words need to be said in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, the 12th verse, simply says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the work I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, Aaron. Because I am going to the Father. John Cheney, at his heart, came out of the experience of black people in the 20th century who had been categorically denied opportunity, but never grew bitter, but grew better, and defeated everything that came his way. And the great measure of who John Cheney is, is how well Aaron McKee does, not as a basketball coach, but as a black man and as a father, by how Mike Vrieswick moves through life as a great executive and a father. That is what John Cheney wanted. John Cheney demanded and wanted, if it was a young cadet coach named Cohen, he wanted him to do the best he could and to do greater things than even himself. There was not a shred of insecurity in John Cheney when he watched people who he loved and cared about do great things. Doing great things he saw was simply endemic to the human experience and that all of us should do great things. It did not matter if you came from 18th in Columbia or you lived in Rittenhouse Square. John Cheney wanted you to do better in his heart, in his soul in what he demanded of NCAA basketball, in what he demanded at Cheney State Teachers College, in what he demanded on this court, which now bears his name because he had the audacity and the temerity to live a life of values. Do greater things. Jesus does, this is going to be a three minute, three and a half minute sermon, Baptist time. He's, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the work I have been doing. If you love John Cheney, do the work that John Cheney did. Do not allow your words to be gonging cymbals and tinkling, tinkling cymbals and gonging brass. If you believe in what John Cheney did, mentor people like Mark Jackson has done. If you believe in what John Cheney did, stand up to the power structures who would systematically preclude and exclude people. If you love John Cheney, if you want to follow John Cheney, do the work that he has done. Teach your children. It does not start at 531. It starts at 529. And if you are late, he'll bench you. Teach your children that. 
and teach them the same thing that Aaron McKee taught them, that if you spoil your children and spoil your grandchildren and ruin their future, they will walk again. Don't let the wagon fall down the hill. That is what John Cheney taught us. And I know he taught me because when I was 11 or 12 years old, out on that campus, my mother and father had left me in Martin Luther King Hall. God knows I was crying after one day of practice with John Cheney. But he put something in us so that we would be tougher than whatever came our way. Do the work and be greater. John Cheney's name is on this court because he lived a life of greatness. And I saw the rivalry among the organizations and the institutions who wanted to lay claim to him. The brother claimed and said he started at Cheney, but then somebody else came and said, no, it was at Simon Gratz. And then somebody else said, no, it was at Sayre. But it's, it's obvious in his life that it started with who he was. There was something deep inside of his black spirit that allowed it to triumph over the racism of the NBA and that allowed it to triumph over the imaginary fights of the Globetrotters because he knew there were greater and bigger fights ahead. John Cheney knew what Jesus knew because Jesus in this text, he says, do the work, be greater, and you'll do it because I'm going to the Father, because John Cheney understood relationship. I was amazed this week when Pamela and I were talking, and she was so ecstatic, and she said, I found my daddy's Bible. I didn't even know he had a Bible. I know the fellows who played for him probably didn't think he had a Bible either. John Cheney's faith was the best kind of faith. It was not this artificial stuff where people are walking down the street with big Bibles and propping up big crosses. It was a personal profession of faith that was lived every day of his life because he loved the people he was around. And if you love everybody and encourage everybody and chastise them sometimes and demand the best of them, you are doing precisely what Jesus did. I'm not worried about John Cheney's kind of faith because his children and grandchildren have read his Bible. And it shows you what's inside of this man. The last time when in Black Baptist Church, when I say three minutes, it's really seven. The last time I saw Coach Cheney, I was on my bike. I had my sunglasses on. I had my helmet on. And I was at the corner of 18th and Walnut. And I didn't see Coach Cheney until I saw this young white kid cut him off on Walnut Street. He was driving a little sports car. It wasn't his 850. I think it was a two-door something. And this young kid who cut him off couldn't have been more than 25 or 30. Nice car. And all I saw was Coach Cheney jump out of the car. He ran around to the kid, and since I'm a preacher, I'm not in church right now, but I'm in the Leah Chorus Center, and I'm sure Temple has a code of conduct, so I cannot use the words that Coach Cheney used that day to bless that young man. But when he finished, I know that young man had a new sense of God and religion. And as he was walking back to the car, I made co eye contact with Coach Cheney, I took my glasses off and thought he would be happy to see me. And he looked at me and said, what? Got back in his car, cooled out, waved to me and said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing good. I was still scared. Coach Cheney understood relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, Basketball players, whether you're at Sayre, 
Ben Franklin, Gratz, Cheney, Temple, or the camp. The mystery and secret of John Cheney's greatness is relationship. And he had a relationship. We are better people because of John Cheney's life. Yesterday, as I was leaving church, I told a minister who's in his mid-60s that I was to speak at Coach Cheney's funeral. He said, man, Coach Cheney, he's from North Philly. Coach Cheney was my gym teacher. He said, I was in the gym one day and I fell. I broke my leg. I was so embarrassed. He said, Coach Cheney picked me up and looked at me. He said, I can carry you. You hardly wear as much as my wife. And he was embarrassed. He said he's still embarrassed when he goes to his high school reunions. And people laugh and joke at him because he broke his leg and Coach Cheney carried him. That's who Coach Cheney was. He carried us. As I look at this program, it's so beautifully and spectacularly done. It encompasses every imaginable element of Coach Cheney's life. And as pristine and flawless as it is, I see a glaring error right at the top of the second page. It says 741 career wins. Coach Cheney has had another win today. He's up to 742. Because for Ch Coach Cheney, there is a crown that has been laid up in store for all of those who love God, demand greatness, and understand relationship. Long live Coach Cheney. And the Baptist preacher was shorter than the brother from Cheney. <laughs> God bless you all. Good evening, everyone. My name is Melanie Hawkins Tudos. This is my father, Bruce Hawkins, and we, along with our staff, are your funeral directors this evening. On behalf of the Cheney family, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Pastor Mitchell for his words of comfort, Dr. Englert, and the entire Temple University staff for making every accommodation possible to ensure today's services were wonderful. Our esteemed guest speakers who shared their reflections and remembrances on a life so well lived, our talented musicians, and those of you who sent flowers, cards, condolences, and most importantly, for your prayers. Before we conclude this evening's service with our team chant and benediction, we would like to invite Ms. Charlene Holloway to come at this time with a very special selection dedicated to the Cheney family from the Bruce Hawkins Funeral Home family and staff with the hope that it brings you some comfort during your hour of bereavement. To God be the glory for a life well lived. How can I say thanks for all the things you have done for me. A love so undeserved, and yet you gave your only son for
for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am, or hope to be. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And if I should gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. Can you hear me? Good late afternoon. Pam, John Jr., may I have permission to speak? <clears throat> I've walked around this building about six times today in circles, kind of getting my thoughts together. And I'm going to start out by saying, that goes to the wind. Uh, if people know me, they know I'm an early riser. And I've been rising early most of my life. But for about the last week, I've been getting picked on by somebody getting me up at around 420, between 420 and 433 every night, I mean every morning. That's a good number, to, some good numbers to play for about the next week for you gamblers. <laughs> and so he had a funny way of doing things like that, showing up at all the right times but all the wrong places for me personally. But it's not about me. 
Walking around here, I stopped at a picture on the wall of Coach Dumphy, Coach Litwack, Coach Daly, and Coach Cheney. And something came over me, and it said, Mark, tie it all together. So that's what I'm going to do. Before we do the team together, I'm going to tie it all together. I said something last week about people. And I told a few people this. I think I told Raheem Mapp this. I said, great people see greatness before greatness sees them. Now, I'm going to take you back to a drive that Coach and myself had going to a, an awards ceremony in Jersey. Might have been a sophomore, junior. And I kind of asked him random questions. And I said, Coach, do you ever write speeches down when you speak? And he looked at me while I was driving, and you know he was kind of blind. And I'm like, keep your, keep your eyes on the road. So he said, Mark, he said, I, son, I never write a speech down. He, say, he said to me, I use a theme. And I go off of that theme. And in using that theme, I connect to the people. And so whenever I get off of what I'm talking about, I always go back to that theme. And so I kind of held on to that because what he was saying to me is he was speaking from his heart. He was speaking from his heart. So I'd like for you all to indulge me for a moment as I tie it all together and speak from my heart. See, the theme of it is great people see greatness before greatness sees them. So imagine a chef wakes up 4.30 in the morning to get his thoughts together as he sits down to prepare a meal for the masses. He writes down three things. And the guys, you'll know about this when I say it. The first thing he writes down is the role that this meal will play in the nourishment of people. The second thing he wrote down were the rules to preparing this meal. The third thing he wrote down was the responsibility of getting it to the masses. So he sits there and contemplates before he walks down to the kitchen, a modest restaurant kitchen about well, about as big as this right here. And all of the things that he was about to indulge in making this meal was already prepared because he had did it the night before. And so around 5.30, he gets a pot. And now remember, everyone will be represented in this meal. So the pot represented the Cheney family, the family that held it all together. The first thing he did after he turned the eye on, medium heat, he put the oil in, and the oil represented the Cheney teams. Upon putting the oil in, he sprinkled some Greek sea salt, just a sprinkle of it, which represented his transition from Cheney to Temple and being hired by Peter Lear Chorus. Then he threw in his fives, which, which we consider our bigs. He threw in carrots, onions, and celery. And he cooked those and stirred them for about two minutes. Upon stirring them, he put in his fours. His fours were the potatoes, 
and the bell peppers. You know, takes potatoes a little longer to cook. So he stirred those things around. After doing that, he put in his threes. His threes were his tomatoes. Tomatoes had fresh basil, oregano, a little garlic. Stirred those up. Thought about seasoning, so he put in some onion powder. Some onion powder and some garlic powder, which represented the tutors as well as the trainers. Also, along with the threes, came the vegetable broth. With the vegetable broth, he had to think for a second and put in a little brown sugar. That little brown sugar was Miss Davis, secretary, to keep everything a little sweet. So now, he cuts the heat up, you know, because he has to cook the potatoes. And he's stirring, contemplating and stirring. After that, he brings about these good people, his twos. His twos were cabbage and some string beans. You know, kind of roughage to nourish the body, you know, and, and, and let things keep flowing. He added a little more seasoning. Then he threw in his ones, which for me was the basil or the bay leaf, not the basil, the bay leaf, excuse me. And the bay leaf enhances the flavor of the meal. The ones were most important because the ones could never be eaten. They were always taken out and put in another meal. So he stirred and stirred, and just like any master chef, he needed to taste his food. So he took a ladle and tasted the food, cut it down a little bit so that it would simmer, and said to himself, it needs more seasoning. So he took out some sea salt, a little pepper, which represented all of the assistant coaches that were to be beside him in his journey of making this meal and presented it to the masses. And he stepped back for a second and he reached in his pocket and he pulled out, I don't know what it was, it was some kind of little pouch that he usually has money in, but he didn't have any money in it at this time because he hadn't made any money. And he pulls out a special, special seasoning. And in this seasoning, he didn't know what it was, but at the end of it, it had El Tabasco in it. And El Tabasco was something that he was. He was El Tabasco to us every year before the season started because that's what he told us he was, because he was bringing some heat. So he sits down now as he watches the soup simmer. And he thinks to himself about the shoulders that he rode on to become a chef, the shoulders of Mrs. Cheney, the shoulders of Mary McLeod Bethune, the shoulders of Malcolm X, the shoulders of Martin Luther King and all the other people and the people that he now stands beside, stand besides, people like John Thompson, people like Coach Maloney, and now standing beside him is Coach Norman. And so, again, he gets up and right before he prepares to open the door 
to his restaurant and let the masses in to feed them, he looks upon this soup and he sees his reflection. And I know many of you have heard him say this, but I'm going to tie it together. See, a great teacher, when he teaches and he looks out at his students, he likes to see the reflection of himself. And in that, he did. But the greatness about that is when the student looks back at the teacher, they see their own reflection. People, this is called the mirror of the creator. And all your life, if you are aware and you teach and you can see your reflection in your student, but when your student looks at you and see their reflection in your face, that is greatness. See, great people see greatness before greatness sees them. Coach Cheney saw the greatness in us before we saw it in ourselves. But when we look back now, we reflect and we see our face in him. Again, great people see greatness before greatness sees them. That's a great person. That is greatness right there. And I say that, and I know that he taught us, like Mike said, to stay together. And I'm up here right now, as I know my, my friend, my Siba, which is teacher, and all of you guys, teacher, has transitioned, but he's transformed as well. He's transformed into all of us. And so, as he becomes now an ancestor, I would like for you, if you can, besides the family, everybody stand up, please, for me. And though the players kind of know this much better than a lot of people, make this like the first time as we send Coach Cheney, who's already there, but we armor him with our team together. And when I say give him his armor, armor, give him his armor. I'll say team, you guys stay together. We're going to do it three times, and this is the first time. It'll never be the last, ever. Team! Yeah. Team! Yeah. Team! Yeah. We love you, Coach. <laughs> Good evening. First, I want to say thank you all for coming here and supporting our family. My name is Kerry, and I am um, so fortunate to have had a chance to marry Coach Cheney's daughter, Pamela. The first day that I met him, it was one of the most incredible things. He was like an icon or a figure that you, you know, you, I, I had never met anyone of his caliber, of his, of his brilliance. But what was really striking was right around the time when, I, um, when Pam and I decided to get married was the Kyla Perry incident. And then I had to walk up to his bedroom to ask him to marry his daughter. And as I went up those stairs, it was one of the scariest moments of my life. And as I, when I began to talk to him, he asked me a question. He said, why do you want to marry my daughter? He said, the question 
is always more important than the answer. And I thought about that. And as I was expressing to him how she was my best friend and how much I loved her and that we did everything together, I began to relax. And as I began to relax, we began to talk more. Well, fast forward to this year. I had a pleasure, my wife and I, of being able to care for him in his final days. I was with him every day from um, March up until the end of October. And um, then I would see him maybe a couple times a week. And the wonderful thing about my dad was that he was always a teacher, just like everyone else has said here. So I would learn about people like Tarzan Cooper, who was the first man to get into the Basketball Hall of Fame, but yet never played in the NBA. I didn't know anything like that existed. He would have me, he would tell me to get on my phone, which he called your machine. He said, get on that machine and look up Tarzan Cooper. So I get on my phone and look him up. And um, then he would call up his friends and things like that. And if I'm in the room, he would actually have me talk to them. So I had an actual, um, the experience of being in his room with him when John Thompson called a couple of days before he passed away. And um, it was, for me, it was once again like another icon. But the reason why this was um, such an important time in my life was I had a chance to be with him every day until about 4.30 in the morning. We didn't go to bed at night. We would talk every single night. We would laugh and joke and go through stories. So I know the story about the bus that caught on fire. I know some of you guys know what I'm talking about. And I also heard about that airplane when someone didn't get on on time. You know, there were so many different stories that he shared with me and we would be just cackling and just laughing. But one of the greatest things that I learned from being around him was his ability to analyze. He could analyze anything and he would put it in very simplistic terms so that you could understand it. He, he, he could break it down to a level where um, you would be saying, wow, I feel pretty dumb now. But at the same time, he was so such an uplifting spirit. He would also talk to you and encourage you to be the best that you can be. So I want to say that in my life, this has been one of the greatest experiences this has been one of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had, and I love him so much. He shared with me, and he made me the best chef ever, because I don't know if you guys know, but he was a chef. He could taste anything and tell you not only what was in it, he could tell you what wasn't in it. And so for me, he would have me, as I would prepare, prepare foods for him, he would tell me, well, you didn't put this in there, don't do that. Just a few days before he passed, I had the opportunity when he's coming out of the hospital to cook something from he liked. I, some of you guys know that um, he liked different things that were, you know, um, he'll tell me, hey, you can have the Kobe steak, but you're not getting any of my chicken gizzards, right? So he would, um, I had a chance to make it for him and he told me, you have one chance to fail. And I said, I'm not gonna fail, Dad. He would tell me all the ingredients. He would tell you how much he knew every single step of what needed to go in that. I prepared the best meal of my life for him before he passed, and I had a chance to see him enjoy it. And um, I just, once again, who do you, what do you give to a man that great? I was able to just do a meal because he had everything. He's given me more the love, the fatherhood, I, I have realized how many brothers I have out there when I hear all of you guys talking about the fatherhood in him. He was the greatest father I ever had, and um, I love him so much, and I miss him. Thank you. Amen. This has been a celebration of life. And there will be no benediction, but there will be a dismissal because we will, we will be at the cemetery tomorrow at noon where the benediction will occur. Now I leave you in the hands of the Hawkins family. Love each other and demand greatness from each other. 
and do the work that John Cheney showed us how to do. The family would stand, please. Yeah. 